Yes. Uh, so we are in First John chapter three. Uh, we'll now look at verses ten uh, to twelve. If we could have someone read out verses ten to twelve in First By John. By this chapter. it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Eleven also, Pastor. Uh, from ten up to twelve. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning: that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil, and his brother's righteousness. Yes. Okay. So uh, here uh, we see that uh, John is trying to show how can we know whether we are children of God or children of the devil, who is a true Christian, who is a fake Christian. So how can we tell uh, the difference? So here uh, the argument that he presents is that um, anyone who does not do what is right, that is, they're living in disobedience, they're living in outright sin, they're doing whatever they want to do, and they're saying, oh, we are sinless, we are incapable of sinning. So these actions of ours, they're not actually sinful. OK, so people who are doing that, who are not living in obedience, we automatically know that they are not true Christians. The other uh, argument he presents is people who also are not living in an attitude of love towards the family of Christ. Such people also are not true believers. So again, you know, we need to remember he's not making general statements just like that. He is talking in a very specific context. He's talking about this issue which has come up where these Gnostic Christians are making all kinds of allegations. And so he's very, very specifically thinking about that, what the believers are facing right now in the church because of all the accusations being made by the Gnostics and by all the uh, st uh, strategies and schemes that they are coming up to pull away more and more people from the church and you know take them into their uh, Gnostic system. So it's against all of this that he is writing. OK, so these are not just general statement, statements that he is making. He is trying to clarify this particular issue. So he says, how can we know in the, in the situation in which you are living right now in, the, in your church, how can you know who is a true Christian and who is a fake Christian? You will see that these people who are going around and saying all kinds of high, high mighty things, but when you look at their lifestyles, they're living in sin and they have the, you know, temerity to say, no, 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 this is not sin. We are incapable of sin. Such people know for sure that they are not true Christians. And the other thing he says is, you will observe that these people, even though they are, uh, you know, they claim to be uh, having some, some superior relationship with the spirit of God, they are not living in love. Why? Because they're separating themselves from the church. They're making accusations. They're saying that you people are inferior. They're doing all of that. And they are not willing to mingle with you, sit with you, eat with you, fellowship with you, because they think that they are something superior. And is that the attitude of a true Christian? So he says, another way that you can know whether they are true Christians or fake is that you know, it can very, very clearly be seen that they are not willing to you know, love all the other believers and be with them. They're very big on words. You know, They're very big on this new theories that they're coming up with. But when it comes to the actual practical lifestyle, are they living in love? Are they reflecting the, the, the you know uh, the the compassion of Christ in their everyday walk? So uh, he says there is no attitude of love. In fact, they are you know uh, living in a hostile manner and making all kinds of allegations against other believers. Okay, so such people automatically you should begin to be aware that such people are not too true Christians. And he goes on to give an example. He says, Cain was like that. Cain was uh, like, these, well, like, like these people who do evil things, who live an evil lifestyle. And um, um, so they automatically hate those who are living a righteous lifestyle. Uh, so this 
they automatically feel this hostility towards those who are who genuinely belong to god and in the same way cain felt this uh, hostility towards his brother these fake christians have feeling a hostility towards us i know so uh, so watch out is what he is, he is saying um so it says over here uh, we should love one another for this is the message you heard from the beginning we should love one another so do not be like cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother and why did he murder him there's a reason why he murdered him why did he murder him because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous and he couldn't handle it he did not want to be uh, to to be exposed as doing evil things he did not like it look at the interesting you know um, point which john is making here he says why did cain murder abel um, did it have something to do with sacrifices it says the reason why cain actually murdered his brother is because his own actions were evil and god pointed it out god pointed a finger at him and said you know why have you you know why is your face downcast you know if you repent and do what is good you also will be accepted so the issue over here is not just something about sacrifices there's something deeper god says why is your face downcast you know why do why do you not do good if you do good you too will be accepted the same way abel was accepted so over here we come to the core of what cain was angry about he was very very angry that god was not accepting him and god was clearly pointing a finger and saying your lifestyle is evil it is sinful it is not good and that really upset him on top of that god approved of his brother and declared him to be righteous and um, we have other scriptures which support this you know we will look at even those verses but the main point that is being brought out here is that those who are living in wickedness and they are, and they are trying to pretend that they are righteous when it's when they when their um, when their double standards are exposed it makes them upset and they have this hostility towards those who have, who are truly righteous who are not practicing hypocrisy and double standards but really standing for god they can't stand that uh, it makes them angry okay so um just to kind of touch a little bit very briefly on this whole cain able thing um, you know because it's been brought up over here um both of them come and make their offerings and people come up with all kinds of elaborate explanations about why you know uh, cain's uh, sacrifice was rejected and why abel's sacrifice was accepted uh, 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 one popular argument is that um, you know abel brought a blood sacrifice he brought a lamb on the other hand cain just brought grains and so that was not acceptable uh, now uh, we do not know exactly what instructions god gave them regarding the offerings if if we are to think that you know they were giving a thanksgiving offering where abel was bringing out of the gratitude of his heart and cain supposedly was bringing out of the gratitude of his own heart they would obviously bring whatever they have in their hands um, able being a shepherd would obviously bring a lamb cain on the other hand is not a shepherd uh, he is a uh, you know a farmer he grows crops so he would obviously bring whatever is his so um, and moreover we see in leviticus chapter 2 verse 2 and in other places that grain offerings were considered an a pleasing aroma by the lord so it most probably god is not upset that uh, you know one person is bringing uh, a sacrifice from his i know line of uh, livelihood and the other person is bringing his offering from whatever you know profession he is practicing so that probably is not why god was upset also another thing that is said is that maybe abel brought a really nice fat uh, you know um uh, lamb on the other hand cain maybe he just brought something substandard but then we can see how uh, how much cain values god's uh, um you know approval he wants to be approved by god uh, so obviously he would not have brought just something substandard and something you know that's half uh, rotten he would have brought his best crop i'm pretty sure so that probably is not why uh, you know um, god says um, uh, no to him 
also there are some people who say that you know cain uh, must have brought a um cain uh, they they say that uh, cain brought a sacrifice but abel brought a gift because that is the way the translation happens in the uh, greek translation the, you know old testament greek translation the septuagint it refers to abel's offering as gift okay the word gift is used on the other hand cain's offering is referred to as a sacrifice and so they say ah you see when you make a sacrifice you only have to give a portion of it at the altar the rest of it goes back home with you so cain must have brought a sacrifice on the other hand abel just gave a gift which means he doesn't take back any of it home all of it you know it stays over there in the uh, in the presence of god now again um, that don't know whether it's a very valid argument uh, simply because in the hebrew uh, you know original hebrew where the verse is given you know genesis 4 verses 4 to 5 both of them are you this both their offerings are, have the same word being used both of them are called gift okay cain's thing is called a gift abel's offering is also called a gift um so uh which is why uh they say that what actually made cain unacceptable was his lifestyle the way he was living was not right so it was irrelevant what he is bringing whatever he brings will be automatically irrelevant because he is not bringing his heart he is living a li uh, evil lifestyle but he's just trying to make an offering now let's look at uh, an, uh, an, uh, another verse you know which can maybe back up what we have said uh, of course we have a very clear explanation given over here in first john itself uh, where you have you know in verse 12 first john chapter 3 verse 12 where it says why did he murder him because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous okay so he did not like that and uh, the in hebrews 11:4 it says by faith abel brought god a better offering than cain did by faith he was commended as righteous when god spoke well of his offerings and by faith abel still speaks so abel was a man of faith he trusted in the lord he obeyed the lord he lived in a way that pleased the lord because he had completely placed his trust in god and wanted to be under him so obviously in contrast we would have to say that cain was not a man of faith he was not trusting in god he was not following god's ways he was not living in a way that would please and honor god so when he brought his sacrifice god considered it unacceptable and god in fact gives him a chance a second chance and says to him why is your face downcast if you do well you too will be accepted so all you have to do is change your lifestyle start doing righteousness you too will be accepted but cain instead of repenting he decides instead to go in the opposite direction and you know take out his anger against his brother so over here john is telling don't be perturbed don't be disturbed by the terrible things that these gnostic christians who are you know in who are in an influential position you know they are they are they're treating you so badly but do not be disturbed by them and do not be attracted by them because these are people who are not people of love they are like cain they in fact dislike anything that is righteous they in fact have a hatred towards the things of god so do not uh, be troubled when they say bad things about you it is to be expected they automatically hate you because they are evil and you are righteous and they can't handle that and also do not be attracted to them because if you go to them you will discover that they are not a people of love they are a people uh, who do not have the love of god in them so do not be misled by them okay so uh, this is one very important teaching that he is trying to bring out to the to the true believers in the church okay so um moving on to the next thing that maybe we can look at um what are real believers like what kind of a love do they show you see it's very easy to talk love but then when it comes to actually you know living out a life of love uh you know that kind of a lifestyle that involves much more and so i think this passage is very valid it was not just valid in uh, john's day it is very valid even now if i claim to be a follower of jesus christ and if i say that i love the family of christ 
how am I expressing it? How am I expressing my love? It has to show up in my actions. It's not enough to just talk. Okay, so uh, if we can, um, if someone could read, uh, could read out this chunk, and you know, even as we are reading this passage, I want us to look at what Jesus is saying over here through John. You know, what is what is what is the Holy Spirit teaching us about how love should be shown? So if you are uh, loving in this kind of a manner, then yes. You genuinely are behaving like someone who belongs to the family of Christ. So, First uh, uh, John chapter three, verses sixteen to twenty-two. If someone could read out, and if the rest of us could just pay attention to what is being said, yeah. By this we know love that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him. How does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases his commandments and do okay. what pleases him. Yeah. So here uh, it says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? So these fake Christians were probably in that category. They had money in their hands. They had influence on their side. But when they saw people in need, their own brothers and sisters in the Lord, they were not doing anything for them. And then it goes on to say, you know, um, OK, uh, yeah. So in verse 18, he says, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth, you know, in genuineness is what he's saying. And in verse 19, this is the um, teaching that he is giving us. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. He says, you know, you need to make sure that you are living in the truth. Um, uh, when you go into his presence, your heart should be at rest in his presence. You should be able to say, OK, my heart is not condemning me. So how can you have a heart which is at peace when you go into his presence if you are doing what pleases him? He is a God of compassion. He is a God of love. He wants to reach out to those who are in need and provide for them and help them. So when you go into his presence and you feel this restlessness in your heart and your heart is saying you're not reaching out uh, in love and being generous, then you better do something about it. So he says, if our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. So. When your heart is restless within you and it is telling you that you're that you're being miserly or you're deliberately not helping, realize that God is greater. His heart is a heart of great compassion and much generosity, and you are supposed to imitate him. So don't follow your, you know, your carnal heart, which wants to hold on to your positions, which doesn't really want to let go, which doesn't really want to be generous. Do not follow your heart, which is little and narrow and restricted in its thinking, but rather realize that God is greater and he knows the motives of your heart. He knows whether your heart is being stingy and selfish or whether it is being generous and selfless. So when you're in his presence, your heart will, will stir up inside you. It will condemn you in case you are not living actually in love. You will sense it. And so when you sense that, you know, take action, bring yourself in line with his with him so that your heart can be at rest regarding this matter. On the other hand, if your heart is not condemning you, it means that, you know, you are living right. You are living in, a, in love with people and you are being generous in 
if that is the case you can be confident and ask god for whatever you need because in the same way you were you know compassionate enough to provide for others now he will in the same way compassionately provide for you so you see in a way what you are you know um, giving out to others the measure in which you give it, give out to others it will be given to you uh, in the sense how much compassion are you exercising uh, in the in your interactions with the other fellow believers in that same measure god will also you know give to you of course god is more generous than that he you know he even sometimes when we are um, miserly and unhelpful he still helps us uh, but there's an important point being made over here uh, when you go into his presence and your heart is stirred up about this thing it says immediately take action be at peace with him regarding this matter because god knows everything he knows the mo motives of of our hearts and uh, uh, in the same way we are being compassionate and generous towards others he too will be compassionate and generous towards us you know when it comes to our prayers and our requests and our needs uh, very very important passage you know and uh, um, we can see a reference to this uh, even in deuteronomy chapter 15 verses 7 to 10 because they say that most probably you know john was picking up these principles that he's teaching over here he was basically picking them up from deuteronomy 15 7 to 10 um, if you could turn in your Bibles to that, you don't need to read it. I'll just kind of you know, highlight a few things. Uh, but the very, very same things which we look, we talked about just now in in First John, you know, chapter three, the very same things you see them being mentioned over here in this uh, Deuteronomy passage. So Deuteronomy chapter fifteen, verses seven to ten. You know, it uh, in uh, so in Deuteronomy fifteen seven, it says, "Do not be hard-hearted." or tight fisted you know towards those who are in need the exact opposite is mentioned in eight rather be open handed and freely lend them whatever they need okay and um, then in verse 10 it says uh, deuteronomy 15 10 it says give generously to them and do so without a grudging heart don't give it grudgingly because you have to. You've been ordered by God and now there is no choice. Don't do it that way. Rather, give it generously uh, because the Lord has been so merciful to you in, in, with your prayer requests. Whenever you went to him, he gave you lavishly, generously. Now show that same love to others as well. You know, so um, it says, uh, so it says in Deuteronomy 15, 10, do so without a grudging heart then because of this, the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. So a very important vital teaching is being taught over here, um, you know, by John. He is saying, don't be like these fake Christians. They're big on words when it comes to lifestyle, pathetic. They're very stingy. Uh, they have uh, very hard hearts. Their hearts are not even moved by the pain that they see. Uh, so do not be like them. So having said that, just to add a word of, you know, um, caution or maybe a word of wisdom, whatever, you know, there are people who take advantage of this. Uh, they will go on and on asking you, you know, for financial support, but they will not get a job and begin to work. Uh, so if you see that, do not encourage laziness. God never supports laziness. If you open your book of Proverbs, he will, ex he will use the harshest words about laziness. So never encourage someone's laziness. If they are genuinely in need, you know, and you are in a position to help them get back on their feet. You know, um, so the, the thing to remember is um, don't just keep giving people fish. Teach them how to fish so that they can stand on their own feet and do their own fishing. So anything that you can do to help a person get back on their feet, please help them. And if they're in the process of trying to get back on their feet and, you know, they're, and they're, they're still in the process and they have, have not yet, uh, reached, you know, got a job or something, yes very very much help be very very helpful but never be a person that they can you know just depend on like on support and they never ever bother to do their own fishing no that would be a very very wrong uh, way to go about it so if when someone is trying to get on their feet oh do whatever you can to help them but 
never ever encourage laziness is what I would say from my set <laughs> based on practical experience. Uh, yeah. Another thing that I thought you know we could really um, talk about uh, was this uh, verse because again there's a lot of controversy regarding this. So we've you know we just quickly come over here into chapter four, uh, and uh, the passage that I have in mind is chapter four, verses seven to nine. So if someone could please read out, uh, you know, First John chapter four, verses seven to nine. Yes, ma'am. First John chapter four, seven to nine. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. He that loves not lo knows not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Here right. is love. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So here it says, uh, you know, we we let us love one another for love comes from God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. So after saying that you are a, a, a child of, a, of such a loving and compassionate God and, you know, if his sperm or in other words, his Holy Spirit is living in you, then you should be something like him. Uh, you should be imitating him. In fact, your heart should be like his heart. So uh, obviously, it is very, very essential that we should live in love and we should show our love to those who are in need. Uh, and then it goes on to say, how did God demonstrate his love? He did so by sending his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. You know, we would not even have life. We would die. We would be destined for hell. The only reason that we have of an eternal future in God's presence is because he sent his one and only son. And now the main problem over here is the way this particular term is translated. It has led to a lot of uh, you know, doctrinal confusion. Um, and it has unnecessarily brought us criticism from the Muslim community, which say, oh, you're saying that God gave birth to, to Jesus, is it? Oh, that means he has a wife sitting somewhere. And OK, what kind of a God is that? And there's a lot of unnecessary um, you know, um, controversy that has been stirred up just because the translation was wrong. OK, so we uh, I would really like to just touch upon this, even though it may take a few minutes. Uh, so over here, uh, the Greek word used over here in our uh, uh, chapter 4, verse 9, uh, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his monogenous son into the world. Okay. God sent his monogenous son into the world. And KJV um, mistakenly translated it as only begotten. Okay. The only uh, one given birth to. The only one given birth to okay would be the like the literal meaning of that. So that's the kind of wording that they used. And of course, even NKGV now continues to use that same word. But if you will notice, in almost every other version, they are using the other term. They'll either just say only son, or you know, NIV tries to say one and only son. It's trying to bring out uh, the actual meaning of the word. So NKJV, uh, why are they still holding on to this term uh, only begotten? Why do they translate this as only begotten? Because they believe that this word monogenes is derived from the root word genao, G E N N A O. Okay. They believe that this word monogenes is derived from the root word genao, G E N N A O. Because that particular word, no, that root word, it means to give birth to. Okay. But most scholars today will point out that monogenes is not derived from genao, but rather it is derived from another root word, a different root word, which is G E N O S, genos. Now, anyone from a science background would be actually familiar with this word genus, species, you know. Um, something which belongs to a particular genus or a certain particular species. Uh, so 
their argument is that if monogenes has been derived from the word genao, then monogenes would have had two n's in it because G N N A O has two n's. Monogenes would have been M O N O G E N N E S, but that is not the case. If you look at uh, in in your Greek Bible, you will see that the spelling used over there is M O N O G E N E S. Only one single n. So the root word is not genao, which is giving birth to, but rather the root word is um, genus. So what would, how would we understand that? It would be uh, mono is of course one, and the genus would be your, uh, you know, your species or your kind. So one kind, you know, one 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 specific category, one specific type or kind uh, would be the uh, meaning. Uh, just to you know, uh, bring out a little more clarity regarding this, Hebrews eleven seventeen is a big help in understanding this because that you know the, it uses the same word over there for Isaac, and that really helps us. So, uh, if you could have someone read out Hebrews eleven verse seventeen. Is anyone here? <laughs> Hebrews. Ah, go ahead. By this is love perfected in us. Hebrews eleven seventeen. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Okay, so over here, it's the very, very same word that is being used. He was in the process of, of sacrificing his uh, monogenes. Now we know very clearly that Abraham did not have only one begotten son, right? It's the very same word over here, monogenes. So over here, we will not translate it as only begotten because we know very, very clearly that um, Abraham begat two sons. This was not uh, Isaac was not his only begotten. Uh, there was one more begotten, I know, um, uh, which is Ishmael. So he had two sons. Then why on earth is Isaac being called, uh, you know, only son? Because you see, he's the only species, the only kind of this of this type of son. Because this particular son is unique. He's different. He's one of a kind in the sense. God says, it is through him that I will make my covenant, you know, which is what it's, uh, it says in the next verse, Hebrews 11, uh, verse 18, even though God had said to me, said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. So this covenant will be established, which, which the covenant which God is establishing with Abraham. I am choosing one particular specific son for that purpose. Through him, this covenant will be fulfilled. And so that son, I'm talking about that particular son, you sacrifice him, the uh, only kind or the unique kind. You know, if you were to literally use, translate the word monogenes, uh, the one, the unique, the only uh, uh, species of, of his type. Okay, so like that, in that sense, Isaac... So you can't just, you know, if, if Abraham had 10 sons, he can't go choose whom he wants to sacrifice. He has to sacrifice that unique type, the one which God has his eye on. So in that sense, Jesus, who was sent by God into the world, he is one of a kind son, that unique son, not like any other. We are all children of God, right? But he is monogenous. He is one of a kind. He is one special separate species and none of us is actually like him you know we will be like him in our uh, character uh, so ethically we will become like him when we see him but we will never be uh, you know from the very beginning without origin always existing divine no we would never be that so over here um, in this verse where god demonstrates his love it is saying he sent his unique son his one of a kind son um uh, you know that son he sent into the world so that we can have eternal life 
through him it is not talking about god begetting or giving birth to jesus that term is simply not at all used all right so we, it just helps if we can know that because if someone from the muslim community brings up that particular argument we can explain to them and tell them uh, you see that was just a mistake made in one uh, or two translations on the other hand now we know you know the uh, a lot of work has been done research has been done to show that the root word that was taken was not janao the root word was genus which basically is talking about one of a kind or one type one species that sort of thing something unique something you know uh, set uh, which is different from the others so we could maybe you know uh, answer along those lines if such an argument were to come up uh, yes uh, brother go ahead yes very quickly pastor an observation okay. and a comment um okay. number one john 3 16 that we very very much know that says uh for god so loved the world that he gave so it's not only begotten it's just only son oh uh, you i don't know i'll have to go to my bible hub and look it up i do okay, not want to answer that i have not thought to answer that question <laughs> okay 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 but, but yeah. if, if, it, if it is the same thing because i presume we have established that as the same john who wrote the gospel of john that is writing this so for on consistent basis i believe maybe maybe i'm wrong maybe after you check if it's the same thing that it just goes to sh to prove the authorship of both books that, that's why i just wanted to observe yeah i mean uh, who knows what if it monogenesis is not used over there i'll have to check that because uh, only then you know you, you can just go to bible hub and look it up uh, so uh, then the clarity would be there uh, so uh, it's a very good question i had not thought about that verse while preparing for this uh, yeah so we let Thank us see uh, and i'll put it in the stream page because you know all of us who are in google have access to the stream page so i will post the answer over there without fail maybe by the by evening or something uh, so you will be able to you know all of us will be able to kind of look at that uh, i will uh, throw light on that later oh yes uh, uh, just moving on to another thing that i wanted to touch upon um which would actually be in our chapter 5 um okay we have 10 minutes right uh, all right um so in in chapter 5 you know i'm i'm not i'm not uh, talking about many of the things which are mentioned in chapter 4 simply because it is a lot of repetition uh, john is really pouring his heart out he's bringing out some main specific things one of course is love and the other is you know putting your faith in him and you know um, you know trusting in what was given to you originally and then the third uh, main theme that he keeps talking about again and again uh, is that you know because we have been given the spirit uh, we must uh, you know follow what uh, what was told to us by the spirit originally these are the main concepts that keep running again and again so i have not gotten into all of those because it would become a bit of a repetition for us um, so coming over here into the fifth chapter uh, after having said all that he has said uh, now he says i write these things to you who believe in the name of the son of god so that you may know that you have eternal life so you know he's like now like kind of reaching his conclusion tree so he says now based on all these, these these things i have told you i've told you how you can distinguish between a fake christian and a true christian how a true christian would actually live what their lifestyle would look like uh you know what their obedience would look like uh what their attitude is regarding sinfulness uh regarding perfection they're not pretending that they are perfect they know that they are perfect in the spirit but they know that you know in uh, at a, at, a uh, at the mind level they would still need to work on themselves so you know he's just he's just bringing out all of these uh, all of these facts and um uh, then uh having said all of those things uh, he assures him and says, see, because I know and that is why I have made a clear presentation of everything. So now you will know, I want you to know that you have eternal life, you know, he says. Um, so he wants them to have that assurance that they are in the family of God and that they have nothing to fear. And then uh, he goes on to talk about um, verses 14 and 15, if we can look at. Yeah, if someone could read out chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. 
And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Yes. Um, now, NIV says this is the confidence we have in approaching God. Uh, but actually, that's not very accurate um, because over here, that word that is Greek word that is used over here, it just literally means this is the con confidence we have with God. Okay. Um, so uh, maybe the, just that word with would have been a better translation. Um, okay. Um, if you could just give me a minute. This. Yes. Uh, so um, if we were to literally translate that Greek word over there, rather than saying uh, we have, uh, rather than saying approaching God, we would just say with God. This is the confidence we have, uh, you know, when we are in him, when we are with him, probably would be a better term because that's the same term that is used for, uh, you know, uh, describing Jesus in John 1, 1, where it says uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. So uh, that same term which is used over there is used over here. This is the confidence we have uh, with God. You know, when you're literally in with him, in his presence, when you're in his presence, we can have this confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. OK, uh, and if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. So here, the word here, which is used over here, uh, it, it's not talking about just someone who is hearing a sound, but rather it is talking about someone who hears and immediately reacts and responds to that and reaches out to you know do what is being said. So it's not talking about passive hearing, where you hear a lot of sounds around you, but it's talking about active listening, where you uh, reach out to the person who is asking and you do something for them. So we can have this confidence that he's not just simply hearing in a passive way, but rather he's actively listening to what we are you know, requesting and he will help us. Uh, so it's a very beautiful thing that he's telling these believers who are very confused, who are worried whether they are part of God's family or not. And God is, uh, and, and John is saying over here, you can be confident that if you are in the presence of God, that if you are with him, your needs will be taken care of. Whenever you open your mouth, whenever you ask for anything, he is actively listening and he will reach out. He will give you what you have requested. So have this assurance. Do not be afraid. Do not wonder whether you're part of his family or not. You know, So he is giving them this assurance. Um, another thought you know, we can maybe just take away from this is um, we have verses which talk about how you should go into God's presence and you know, place your requests before him, uh, of the most popular being in Hebrew 4, you know, where it says, you know, go boldly to the throne of God. Uh, so yes, we are meant to go to him with our needs. Um, but you know, another way that we can see it is we don't just go to him. We are always with him always in his presence the same way the word was with god you know throughout eternity always in his presence with him we too actually are like that uh, so it's not like as if you know we are carrying all these burdens on our own and then when the time get, when the time of need becomes like really acute then we go to him with his burdens and you know life is a struggle we don't have to look at life that way we are always with him in his presence he is carrying the burdens we are just walking in step with him on a day-to-day -day basis and we just open our mouths and we talk to him and he listens to what we are saying and he responds so we don't have to think of it as a lonely difficult hard life where we are carrying all these christian responsibilities and we go into his presence with our burdens and we lay it down in front of him. You know, I mean, sometimes it's like so weighty. It is so uh, difficult. 
on the other hand don't picture yourself going into his presence rather just picture yourself as always being with him because that's literally the you know greek used over here this is the confidence we have you know with god when we are in his presence you're constantly there with him he is constantly aware of what's going on in your life so all you do in your, in your time of need is you just open your mouth and you start talking to him and it says we know that he hears us whatever we ask we know that we have what we have asked of him you know so that's this deep assurance that we can have in his uh, presence ouch we are almost out of time um if you, okay uh if i thought maybe we could really look at verses 16 and 17 because there's a lot of unnecessary controversy around these verses and they're actually very very simple because people generally pull them out right uh, out of context they have not gone through the entire uh, first epistle of john the way we have gone through it we they have not looked at the background they are not aware that these poor believers were struggling because of the gnostics uh, we are not aware i mean the general you know believer is not aware of these things and so that they just pull out verses 16 and 17 and get really confused about the whole thing when actually there is nothing no nothing to be uh, puzzled about over here in these two particular verses so verses 16 and 17 if someone could very quickly read out those two verses please anyone says that they're committing a sin by leading to death he shall ask and god will give him life to those who commit commit sins that do not lead to death there is sin that leads to death i do not say that one should pray for that all wrong doing is sin but there is sin that does not lead to death okay so he is talking about brothers and sisters who commit a sin you know we already uh, he, he touched upon it already in chapter 1 he said there will be times when you will sin when you will fall because you still have an unrenewed mind it will happen when that happens go to the lord seek repentance confess your sins and god is just and faithful and he will forgive so over here he is basically saying that you know he's wrapping up all the all the things that have been covered right so this is like a summation and he is saying so when you see a brother or sister commit a sin uh, uh, that does not lead to death you should pray and god will give them life so here he is talking about believers brothers or you know he is talking about um, people who are part of the family so he is saying they made a commitment to the lord jesus the lord jesus became the propitiation for their sin like it says in first john chapter 2 so we are not talking about uh, these fake christians we are talking about true believers who made a genuine commitment to the lord they believed in the teachings which jesus had originally taught and the holy spirit has confirmed that to them in their heart they are standing upon the truth and so the sins which they are committing are not sins leading to death they are already part of the family of god so these sins which they are committing yes what they are doing is sinful they must repent and when they do that god will forgive them so these are not sins leading to death in the sense all of their sins have already been paid for and washed away by the atoning sacrifice of christ so anything that they, that they do tomorrow anything with any sin that they commit next week that sin does not lead to death your next week's sin does not lead to death simply because the atoning sacrifice already has finished washing away all of those sins and god's wrath is not against you any longer so please pray for these believers you know pray that the lord would you know uh, forgive them that they would get back on their feet and the assurance given is that uh, they will be given life resurrection life you know when the rest of the believers receive it they too will receive resurrection life because you know um, these people are feeling scared whether they're part of god's family and they're worried what's going to happen to them so john is assuring them and telling them the sins that you do do not lead to death there's a propitiation that has been made for you you are now righteous so do not be afraid you will have life you will be given eternal life resurrection life after you die so you are in the family you have nothing to fear go ahead and intercede for one another support one another in prayer so that you will remain strong and not sin uh, but if you sin it is uh, you will still be forgiven 
you can still have resurrection life. But there is a sin that leads to death. I am not saying that you should pray about that. He clearly clarifies. He says, uh, and so he again clarifies and says, all wrongdoing is sin. And there is a sin that does not lead to death. So the things which the believers are doing, yes, it is sinful. But the propitiation of Christ has already taken care of that. So you, your sins will not lead to death. You, you will still have eternal life after you die. On the other hand, these fake Christians who are you know, uh, doing the sinful things that they are doing, those sins will definitely take them to their death. No point in interceding for them because if you intercede for them, um, those sins will not just simply be you know, removed because they have to first of all come to Jesus and say, Lord, uh, we believe that you know, that you were fully human and you were fully divine and you actually went on the cross physically and made an atoning uh, sacrifice for us. They have to admit all of those things which they are denying right now you know, because of their Gnostic background. They would need to make that full commitment. Only then can their sins be forgiven. Otherwise, the sins which they are doing are definitely leading to their deaths. No point in offering a prayer for them because they are headed for judgment unless they submit to Christ and actually accept all the truth about him. Okay, so it's just basically talking about that. It's not talking about some great mysterious hidden sin that leads to death and another kind of sin which does not lead to death. It's nothing mysterious about this passage. He's just talking in line with what he has already said throughout his epistle. And I'm so sorry I've eaten up your time. I'll just say one sentence of prayer and we'll close. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much for the things that we could cover today. And Lord, I pray that uh, all these important lessons, you will bring them back to our minds as and when we require them. Bless the students, O Lord, even as they work on all of their final assessments, even as they are, we are wrapping up the semester. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being patient. And yes, we will log off right now.